So if you've got a Bible, please grab it and go with me to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 7. The last few member meetings we've had, we've just, we started walking through Paul's letter to Timothy. And this is his protege. This is the one that Paul is passing on his ministry to. Paul knows that a, a time is soon coming when he will die. And so he is entrusting the ministry, especially at Ephesus, to this young pastor, Timothy. He's writing it so that if you go to chapter 3 and verses 14 and 15, Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. This doesn't mean how we ought to behave when we are in a church building, household of God in that sense. It means how we ought to behave as a member of God's family, as a member of God's household, which is the church, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. So that is the reason Paul is writing, and he's encouraging Timothy, he's guiding him, he's warning him that false teachers will come and what he must do when they come. Now when we get to chapter 2, he starts to get explicit concerning what the church should be doing. He's already given some broad principles, he gave his own testimony concerning his former life as a blasphemer, and he has to defend his apostleship in some sense because false teachers that had infiltrated Ephesus or were trying to, were trying to undermine the authority of the apostle Paul. He does that, and then he charges Timothy at the end of chapter 1, I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So that's where we're at so far in this letter. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, and then we'll pray together. And then we'll see what God has to say to us in these verses. This is God's word, beginning with chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is God's word. Pray with me. Father, we ask you to sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word. Make us more like Jesus. Make us more dependent on Jesus. Make us a people who delight to obey your commands. And to first of all be people who pray. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I have three things that I want to point you to as we walk through this passage, and they are these. First, we must pray. Second, who we must pray for. 
And third, why we must pray. I think that's a proper outline for these verses that are before us in these first seven in chapter two. We must pray, that's in verse one. Who we must pray for, that's at the end of verse one and into verse two. Why we must pray, that's part of verse two all the way through verse seven. So first, begin with me in verse one. We must pray. I want you to notice that Paul, once he transitions out of kind of the introductory part of this letter and making general remarks to Timothy, he says, first of all, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. I want you to notice that he says, first of all, he's saying of first importance. If, if this letter is Paul describing to Timothy how the church must operate, what we must believe, and what our function is to be like, as he has said in chapter 3, I want to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. If that is why he's writing, then he's saying of first importance in the life of the church is that we be a people that pray. That go to God the Father in prayer. In the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, we bring our offerings of prayer, we ask God things. We ask Him for things. And we trust Him in all that we ask. He uses four different words to say what we would just call prayer. He says supplications, which is pretty clearly you're asking something. But then he just uses the generic term prayer. And then he says intercessions, which really means that you're going to the Lord, asking him something on behalf of someone else. And then he ends with thanksgivings. That we would not just ask God things, but we would be thanking God for his provision and we would be praising him. Now, if you try to look at all four of these words and think, okay, which what does each mean? He uses four different words, and, and some of them are pretty clear, like thanksgiving is obviously different than supplications or intercessions. But really, supplications, prayers, and intercessions, those could be used interchangeably. I remember a few years ago as we elders and elders in training were studying through 1 Timothy, we got to this verse, and we were asking the questions and looking it up in commentaries and in our Study Bibles, what do each of these four words mean? He has to use them in a way that he means specific things by them. And we were kind of dumbfounded and we thought, I can't figure it out. And so it was with John Calvin 500 years ago. In his commentary, he says, there are some who try to divide up the first three and make it, this is what he's meaning in them. But he, Calvin just concludes, what Paul meant by using all three of these, if he meant three different things before he gets to thanksgivings, he's saying, I can't tell what he means. Because these could all be used synonymously. And that's what most faithful commentators will tell you, is that you don't need to try to pick it apart and think, well, supplications means one thing, prayer means one thing, intercession means one thing. Well, they do kind of mean a little bit different things, but they all bring the same idea, and it's Paul using these words to make sure that we get the emphasis. He's saying, first of all, we must be a people who pray. He uses multiple words to enforce what he's saying. Any kind of word that has to do with prayer, he's mentioning it. Even though they, if you look up the Greek definitions of these words, they, the first three kind of mean the same. The definitions are borrowed from one another. Then he gets to thanksgivings, which is obviously different, but the point is not to try to get a bullet point of what each of these four things mean as much as Paul is saying, we must pray. And so I ask you, in your life, 
Is this something that marks you as a Christian? That you are a praying person? Do you frequently go to the Lord in prayer? Not just when you're in trouble, but you go to the Lord in prayer to thank Him. To ask His help. Even when you're not in a desperate situation and it's so evident you really need the Lord's help, but you're always going to the Lord in prayer. What about you and your community group? Is this something that you would say, well, first of all, our community group is devoted to prayer. I have to be honest that the group that I'm in and that I lead, I wouldn't say, first of all, we're a people committed to prayer. And that's a failure on my part. We as a church, if we're to look at the things that we do, the regular function of us as a local body, would we say, first of all, we are a people who goes before the throne of grace and we're a people of prayer. If the answer is no, then we need to repent. And we need to realize that's where the Apostle Paul starts. Preaching of the Word is important. It's necessary. It's how God builds up His church. But equally necessary is His church being a people who goes to Him in prayer. We must pray. The second thing we see in this passage is not just that we must pray, but that we learn who we must pray for. And he says at the end of verse 1, for all people. Not just for your local church, not just for other local churches, not just for those who are already Christians, but the main thrust of this passage is that we would be a people who pray for God to save those who are not yet in Christ. When he gets later into these verses, you see that the, the, his meaning behind calling us to pray, even for wicked kings and rulers, he gets to the fact that they need to be saved. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. And so the prayer that he's calling us to is not just prayer in general, but it seems like his emphasis is what we would call evangelistic prayer. Prayer asking God to save people, interceding on their behalf, people who do not yet know Jesus in a saving way, that we would go to the Lord and ask Him specifically to save these people or this person. He says, prayer must be offered up for all people. And then it's interesting that he next turns in verse 2 to talk about a specific group that we need not overlook. And I think it's because, especially in this context and even in ours, it's easy to overlook those who are in authority over us, especially because oftentimes in church history, those who are in authority over us, kings and all who are in positions, high positions, we overlook them because they are so frequently tyrannical. At this time, when in verse 2, he says, for all people, and then he gets specific and says, for kings and all who are in high positions, Nero is the king. Nero is much worse than any ruler you and I have had. Nero is a wicked king, a blaspheming king who took Christians put them on crosses, and lit them on fire in order to light his gardens at night. And Paul says, pray for Nero. Pray for your local lower magistrates who are still in high positions, but they're not the king. Pray for your governing authorities in particular, is what the Apostle Paul is saying here. And it's most likely because they are the first ones, especially in this context in Ephesus in the first century, that these Christians would not want to pray for. I don't want to pray for the salvation of Nero or the magistrates over us that are tyrannical, that are oppressing us. I want God to destroy them. He says, prayers must be offered for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. Even wicked rulers all the more so you and I should 
want to, desire to, pray for our governing authorities, especially when they are wicked. What good is it if you love those who love you? Even those who aren't Christians do that. But Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. All the more we should be praying for governing authorities, especially when they are wicked, oppressive, because they absolutely are making manifest that they do not know Jesus and they need to be reconciled to God through his work. About a week and a half ago, uh, a pastor in Oklahoma who is involved in trying to bring about the abolition of abortion and calling the legislative body to make it illegal to kill a baby is very active in this. He, he was contacted by one of the leaders of the Republican caucus in Oklahoma. It was a closed door meeting and when this pastor got to the meeting, he was asked to leave his phone outside. And he had been to these meetings before and he said, I didn't really know what was going on, but I did. I, I left my phone out and I go into the meeting and to sum up what the meeting was about, this representative of the leader of the Republican caucus of Oklahoma said, you better stop trying to expose these senators and congressmen at this state level, expose them as being really anti-abolition or not really wanting to stand up and protect human life. You need to stop that or we will hire investigators and we will find some way to put you in prison. This pastor is doing what he can to be faithful to the Lord, to rescue those who are being carried off to the slaughter, calling the local government to do what they should do, what God has commanded them to do, to protect the weak and the innocent spending time and money and resources and anything he can do to do this, and the governing authorities over him, when they reject that and they don't want to rescue the weak and the needy, and then the people say, here's the truth. They voted to keep abortion legal. This is what your governing authorities have done. When they just simply point to the truth, this pastor is brought in and said, you stop that. Stop telling people the truth. Stop telling people that we want to keep abortion legal or we're going to do anything we can to put you in prison. They essentially said, we're going to make a martyr out of you. And those are specifically the people that God commands us through the Apostle Paul to pray for. Not to pray against, but to pray for. To pray for their salvation. Pray that they would do what is right. They would come to a saving knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ, especially those. We can't overlook those who hate us, who persecute us, who want to throw us in prison for an unjust reason. The injustice that some of us will experience in this life from our governing authorities really just pales in comparison to the oppression that the first century church experienced from their governing authorities. And still, Paul says, all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. The whole point of this is that we would pray for the salvation of everyone indiscriminately. Any class, any ethnicity, any job, any authority... And he highlights these kings in high positions so that we make sure we, he makes sure we know we are not exempt from praying for them as well. But we should pray for their salvation. This is who we must pray for. All people, even wicked rulers. Do you pray for your rulers? At a local level, at a state level, at a national level... Do we pray for our president, pray for our governor, pray for our legislative body? I'd have to confess that more often than not, in the last few months, I haven't at all, but I've just been angry at our legislative body. 
in Oklahoma because they refuse to show justice to the weak and the vulnerable. And they keep voting to allow abortion to be legal in our state. Calvin in his commentary said, oftentimes when we are in these kind of situations with unjust rulers, it's our fault. He said, have we gone consistently to the throne of grace and asked God to save them, to change them? Have we interceded on their behalf? Have we prayed that we may be able to lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way? Or do we just get upset that we have these kind of governing authorities? He said oftentimes it's God's wrath demonstrated on us because we don't obey Him and we don't pray for the salvation of these leaders. Could that be true of us in Oklahoma right now? We need to pray that they would be saved in Christ Jesus. Next we see the longest list of this passage, why we must pray. We must pray. We must pray for everyone, even kings and all who are in high positions, even wicked rulers. And then halfway through verse 2, we get to why we must pray. And these are the reasons that the Apostle Paul gives. That, for kings and all who are in high positions, that, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Godly and dignified in every way. The point of us praying for our governing authorities is so that they would execute justice as they should. They would protect the right through threatening the wicked. And the end result would be that we would be able to lead a quiet and peaceful life, obeying Jesus and preaching the gospel to everyone. That's what we should desire peaceful and quiet life. That's the end of our prayer. That's the goal of our prayer. Captain Richard Winters dropped into Normandy with the paratroopers on June 6, 1944. He dropped in, he lost his gun, had nothing to defend himself, and he got through that day surviving D-Day, and he sat down at the end of the day and records that I promised myself and God that if I survived this war, I would find a quiet piece of land and I would live in peace the rest of my life. The goal of our life as a Christian is the same goal that Richard Winters said there. He promised himself and God, if I survived, I would find a quiet piece of land and live out my days in peace. And yet he knew that sometimes we must go to battle. We as Christians, our desire should be to live a quiet life. Not always causing an uproar, but to live a quiet life in peace, but Sometimes we must go to war. And the chief weapons of our warfare are the Word of God and prayer. The goal of preaching the Word of God and praying to God on behalf of unbelievers, especially evangelistic prayer, is so that ultimately we may all be able to live a quiet and peaceful life. That's the goal. That's why we fight. That's what we fight with. Weapons of our warfare are not flesh and blood. They're not material. They are spiritual. The word of God and prayer. But the goal of all good fights is that we would be able to live quietly and in peace, in harmony, in tranquility. That's why, that's one of the reasons why we should pray for the salvation of our governing authorities. This is the desire We want to live a peaceful and quiet life. And then he adds, not only peaceful and quiet, free of hostility, but godly and dignified in every way. 
Godliness here means probably a proper attitude. And then dignified has to do with moral excellence. It has to do with a proper life lived. So godliness is like the theme of it, a proper attitude in life. And then being dignified has to do with how you actually live your life. Not only your mindset, but the steps that you take. This is the desire. This is the goal. This is why we must pray for the salvation of everyone. This is why we must intercede on behalf of everyone who does not yet know Jesus. He says, so that we may live a godly and dignified life in every way. The third reason he gives, not only so that we may be peaceful and quiet or godly and dignified, but this next reason in verse 3 why we must pray? Simply, he says, this is good. It's right. That word good means this is morally correct. This is righteous. That we should pray this way and desire these things because praying for the lost so that we may live godly and dignified lives, peaceful and quiet, satisfied in Jesus, living in holiness... The reason we pray for the salvation of people to that end is because it's right. For this is good. This is what God prescribes. That we be a people who pray. Why do we pray? Because it's good. Because God commands it and it is right. And he adds, and it is pleasing in the sight of our God and Savior. When we pray, especially interceding on behalf of sinners who have not yet been reconciled to God, it pleases the Lord. It is pleasing in His sight as we do what is good, as we seek peace and quiet, as we live godly and dignified, as we pray for unbelievers to be saved. He said it's right and it makes God happy. It is pleasing in His sight. How opposite is this from the book of Judges that we've been working through on Sundays? When all the people do what is right in their own eyes, it's chaos. But when we seek to live peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way, we pray doing what is right, it is pleasing in the sight of the Lord. The, look, the Lord looks at us as we pray and intercede on behalf of sinners and it makes Him happy. He smiles at our prayers for unbelievers. Not discriminating against anyone else. It is pleasing in the sight of our God, of, our, of God, our Savior. And then verse 4 he says, Who desires all, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's not the point. But some try to use this verse to explain universalism. To say, it's really God's desire that every single individual who's ever lived will be saved. God is just trying to do that and he hopes that he can somehow save every single person who's ever lived. And that is just not what the Apostle Paul is saying in particular here. He's not saying God just casts out a net and just hopes he can catch some sinners. When he says all, he's talking about in the context, he's saying all types of people from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation, from peasants to kings. That's why he's mentioned kings and that's why he says he desires all types of people, not only poor people, not only rich people, not only middle class people, not only white people or black people, anything like that. He's saying God desires all sorts of people to be saved. We don't know who the elect of God are. Our job is to know that God desires to save all people. And so we preach the gospel to all people. And his elect will respond through faith as he regenerates them by the Holy Spirit. Our job is to not figure out who the elect are. Our job is to pray for all people without discrimination. And God calls them to himself. Many are called, but few are chosen. 
He desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So why do we pray? Why must we pray? The final thing, or one of the final things in this passage is because the only way anyone will be saved is by the one God and the one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. The reason we pray for people to be saved in Christ is because that's the only way anyone will ever be saved. It's through the mediator, Jesus, who stands in our place on the cross, who takes our sin away, who counts us righteous with His righteousness. The reason we pray for the salvation of people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus it's because, verse 5, for there is one God. There's not a pantheon of gods. There's not multiple gods. All roads don't lead to Rome. Only one road leads to the only God. There is but one God. And there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. This word man, you'll even notice if you have an ESV translation that it gives you a footnote saying the word man here is really the same root word that's used for people in verses 4 and verse 1. So really, if a more literal translation would be that Paul has just said, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men, meaning mankind, not just males, but all men, humans. And then he later says, who desires, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And he's using the same word, and then he says, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The Greek literally says, Christ Jesus, man. He is the man. He is the God-man who's come down to be the only way we can have access to God the Father. He is the only mediator. We pray for people to come to a saving knowledge in Jesus. We pray for God to make people alive in Christ because there's only one God. And there's only one way to that God. Do you know that? Do you pray like that? Your friends who are given over to idolatry, your friends who do not trust Jesus, do you know that their destiny, if they keep going as they're going, is not the presence of God's love, but the presence of the wrath of the Lamb? There's one God. There's only one mediator. We must pray for all to meet this mediator, to trust this mediator. And what, what do we trust? What do we look to? What do we cling to? Verse 6, he says, who gave himself, who offered himself, who put forward himself as a ransom for all. As a ransom. What Paul is doing when he says as a ransom for all is the same thing that the Apostle John is doing as he's writing to the church. He's saying he died for all. He's saying anyone who will be saved will be saved through Jesus. Anywhere in the world, the only way anyone can be saved is through the work of Jesus. And anyone who hears the gospel and believes on Christ will be saved. He's talking about the sufficiency of Jesus Death on the cross. It's talking about the free offer of Jesus to everyone who will come to faith in Him. We call everyone to believe. We say, if you believe, if you repent and believe on Jesus, you can know Jesus was your ransom. He shed His blood, not for people in Muskogee, not just for people in Fort Gibson or Oktaha or Shakota or Weber's Falls or Tulsa or Broken Arrow, Coweta. He shed his blood for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He gave his life as a ransom for all. Which is the testimony given at the proper time. 
This really echoes what Paul says in the book of Galatians when he says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born under the law, born, un, born of a woman, so that he would come and redeem us at the proper time, when the fullness of time had come. Paul's emphasizing the testimony given at the proper time. He's saying, God the Father sent God the Son at the perfect time time in history. At this proper time, the Lord sent forth Jesus to die in place of sinners like you and me. So prayer for salvation is in accordance with what Jesus has done on the cross. We know that what he has done is sufficient for everyone and if there are other worlds that we know nothing of, his cross is sufficient for those worlds as well. It's sufficient. Everyone who comes to faith in Him will be saved. And so praying for God to save sinners, it's in accordance with what Jesus has done. His blood was slain so that everyone who comes to faith in Him will be saved. So we pray that God would bring them to faith, that He would give them grace, that He would open their eyes. It's also consistent with God's eternal plan of redemption. The proper time Christ came to redeem his bride. Furthermore, Paul ends in verse 7 with helping us understand that praying for people to be saved is in accordance with or in agreement with the commission that the Lord Jesus gave him as an apostle, as a witness to the gospel. For this, verse 7, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles, of the nations in faith and truth. This is the mystery of the gospel that the chosen people of God, Israel, would, there would be a spiritual Israel. It would include Gentiles like you and me. We wouldn't have to be literally in the lineage of Abraham. But God says it is too small a thing that I would only redeem the ethnic people of Israel. But he says, Jesus, I will make you a light for the Gentiles, a light for the nations. This mystery that we are now grafted into the people of God. That we, though all Gentiles, through faith in Jesus, have access into the new covenant, this new agreement with God. That's why he says, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher even of the Gentiles. It's not just the Jews. It's all who come to believe. The thrust of this passage is prayer. And it's for the salvation of everyone. Do you pray for your friends and family members? That God would save them. You pray for your neighbors that God would save them. Do you pray for your kings and all those who are in high positions? Or commanded to? And may we joyfully be a people who offer up prayers, supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings for all people. And may God give us grace to be a people who obey what he says and say, first of all, we are a people of prayer. And may God be glorified as we continually go to him and plead on behalf of those not yet in Christ. Someone did that for you. I guarantee you, someone prayed for you in particular. And God answered that prayer, yes. And he made you alive. He saved you. Even you. Even me. Won't you go do that for others? Pray with me. Father, help us to bow to your word, to love your word, to love your son, love the spirit, and love you. Help us to be a people as Ecclesia Muskogee that first of all are a people of prayer. Help us not to trust in our own ability to preach or teach the gospel. Help us not to trust in our doctrinal accuracy. 
Help us not to trust in anything or anyone other than Jesus. And may that be exemplified as we continually go to the throne, to your throne, and plead on behalf of those who do not yet know your Son. We ask you, please save our governing authorities. Make them alive in Christ. Grant them repentance. Save our neighbors. Save our family members. Save our co-workers. Help us to be people who go to you and constantly ask for the salvation of sinners. We ask you to say yes to grant those requests and supplications. Help us to be people who intercede for others as you've commanded us. Who offer the gospel to others. Who exhort others to repent of their sin and trust in Jesus and be reconciled to you through what Jesus has done by offering himself as a ransom for all. We thank you that by your providence someone prayed for us and you said yes to that prayer. Help us to go and do that for others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.